grateful to be here with you right now, learning and discussing challenges keeping Tara and Mishpacha. I'm Yoetzer Halacha Tara Ice. I'm live from the Nishmat's Jeannie Schottenstein Center for Advanced Torah Study at the beautiful Elisa M. Flato Building. And I'm Dr. Shai Krug, a psychologist and sex therapist located in New York with a practice in New York and New Jersey. Okay, Shai, I kind of feel like we're opening up a can of worms here. Well, we, we kind of are opening up a, a bit of a can of worms here. This is a really charged, very difficult topic that in many cases is not really talked about fully. Uh, so we're not really uh, aiming to approach this conversation through the lens of trying to resolve or concluding anything in this conversation, but really to be initiating, to be starting the conversation about this topic. That sounds good for me, because at least for us, it feels like there are a lot more questions than there are very smooth, perfect answers. Exactly. So part of what our plan here today is to talk about some of the uh, elements related to uh, Tarot to Mishpacha, talking about some of the challenges and, and struggles that may arise, as well as talking about some practical tools that you can take to kind of uh, to take ownership, bring ownership into your experiences of how you engage these halakhot. Okay, that sounds great. I want to set an important ground rule. We will not be changing what the rules are. And you're certainly not going to be going through nearly every rule in our short time. But what we would like to do is work on our perspectives on these rules. And I'm coming to this conversation as a Yoetz of Halakha, a Nishmat Yoetz of Halakha, after my own 18 years of wonderful marriage. Hi, Rafi. And um, also endless, countless conversations with amazing, amazing women as I work as a Yoetz of Halakha. And I'm approaching this conversation through the lens of mental health and, and psychological and emotional well-being. So I am certainly not an authority on, uh, on halakha or, or religious practice. So I'm really kind of just approaching this through the lens of mental health. So if there are questions that arise, I would certainly always say to uh, seek out a, a yotat halakha or a local rabbi if there are specific questions that are more halakhic in nature. Sounds good. So if you scroll down in the box below us, you can find lots of goodies. We'll be unpacking each of the presents that we've created um, over, the, over the course of our limited time here together. And one of the things you'll see is a lovely source sheet. And what you'll see on that source sheet is that uh, we start out with an ability to talk about the proverbial thorn in the hedge of roses. So there is a concept of referring to our practice of Tarat Mishpacha as a hedge of roses. And the source for that is in Masechet Sanhedrin. And technically, it's about roses serving as a barrier that is sufficient to keep highly charged, passionate, married couple from violating halakha. And they don't need offensive stones. All they need is a little bit of halakha, and then they're totally fine. And it's interesting, they're, the reference, the, the description of a couple as having this flammable passion, it's like chips of wood that are set ablaze, and yet just a little self-control, and you're fine, you're good as golden. But I think those of us who have practiced these laws know that it doesn't always feel like a tiny hedge of roses, it doesn't always feel like a small fence, and it really can impact the couple's relationship. In fact, it's designed to impact a couple's relationship. And, you know, technically the source in Masechet Sanhedrin is explaining why a couple would not need to be chaperoned. They wouldn't need, they would be allowed to have a yichud, right, to be alone together, even at a time when they're not permitted to each other uh, physically, even though in almost every other parallel situation where somebody is considered, where people are considered an Arab to each other, um, that is not the case. They would not be able to even be alone uh, in the same place. That is not the case with um, a married couple, the, the way that the Masechet Sanhedrin refers to it is the Torah testifies on our behalf that we can handle it. This is not too difficult. But I think that when we're exploring what it really means to live these laws, we have to look at the Harcha Kod of it. We have to look at what the broader set of rules uh, are in terms of how we're supposed to behave um, when we're in our two weeks off. Now, the precise way in which a couple keeps these rules and keeps these laws is completely between Hashem and the couple. 
But I do think that regardless of the precision of keeping these laws, looking at the stated reasons for some of the different categories of law really does reflect on our values that are in our tradition and what our tradition sees as values in a Jewish marriage. In general, my philosophy of halakha is kind of a mix of starting with completely submitting our tiny human uh, wisdom and, and, and understanding that divine wisdom is so much greater than that. And I accept that, you know, Hashem has wisdom beyond my tiny brain and what, what even a very wise person can really perceive. However, he also made us meaning-making beings. That's how he made us. And we, by definition, try to make meaning out of everything. And I also believe that Hashem did give us a, a little bit of a window um, into why he set up the rights of the biblical law, laws the way that they are, and that he entrusted the rabbis to delineate the details. And I do personally submit to that wisdom um, that we have been blessed to you know, receive through, through the ages. But um, when we look at Harchakot, it, it's sometimes uh, a, a very common issue that comes up is women will say to me, did the rabbis really think that if I do that act, I will end up violating, we will end up violating a deoraita, a biblical prohibition, and even the isor karate of being physically intimate at a time where we're not supposed to? That must mean that the rabbis must have thought that the nature of a relationship between spouses back in the day was purely sexual, and therefore absolutely anything would, you know, erupt in flames. And that's a very hard thing for people to swallow. And then when they see, I mean, you know, Shai, um, we are uh, male, female, you're a professional, I'm a professional, we're having a conversation that probably wouldn't have happened, let's say, 100 years ago. We wouldn't have had this kind of conversation. The interactions between males and females in professional settings have changed. And although certainly temptation and attraction has remained in the world, you know, multi relationships uh, between males and females, people argue, hey, they're more all multifaceted now. And, you know, maybe it's time to take another look at the laws of Harchakot and revisit them. But part of what I'd like to suggest today, after conversations, you'll hear me quoting my amazing colleagues, Yoetzer Halakha, um, Lori Novik, Yoetzer Halakha, Tirza Kelman, you'll hear me quoting my parents too. Um, but they, um, I do believe, based on my conversations and through my study, that, that, the, that, the, that the, the relationship between a husband and wife was always more multifaceted, and our rabbis recognized that. Now, generally, there were three main categories of behavior between spouses. And again, on that source sheet, you can scroll down, you can take a look at uh, the chart that I made, and you'll see how there's a section which is about fully permitted behavior while a couple is and not permitted to each other, right? Nobody, again, we talked about yichud, um, and there's no, uh, there's no limitations in terms of looking at each other with intention to enjoy um, the other person's face. There are other limitations, but you know, again, this may be little comfort for many people who, who are um, looking at this, but it really, again, the Torah testifies that we're not animals without self-control, just a little bit of regulation and we're good to go. And then there are, there is the category which is the sort of karate of, 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 of full physical intimacy. There is the biblical category of affectionate touch. There are then the rabbinic category, the rabbinic laws, which are often referred to as hergel davar, which are there to protect us from violating the biblical category. And on this one, I will say that perhaps many of us might say, well, did they really think if we did that, it would lead to that? We could argue on that. I'm not saying we couldn't. Um, nonetheless, there is another category which I'd like to turn our minds to right now, which is um, the category which is called um, derech Okay, or um, and and what that seems to be, and this is uh, my my colleague Tirza Kelman has really written an excellent article on this. Um, what that seems to be is a category where there's absolutely no assumption that there will be physical intercourse coming from this these actions, but rather that we are regulating the non-physical, 
intimate relationship. Now, you see that I put another category on the third sheet, and that's because our rabbis do debate certain of the of the topics, certain of the harsha code. Which category is it? Hergal davar? Is it uh, is it chiba? Which one does it go into? But again, let's draw our attention to the fact that our rabbis did want, without any assumption, it was going to lead to physical intimacy to regulate the way in which we interacted. Now, um, nowadays we have a way of calling this shy. What would you call this kind of regulation? That, uh, that I'm talking about here. Right, we're kind of talking about the application of mindfulness, uh, kind of bringing, bringing awareness into the experiences that we're having. Uh, so when we, we talk about the uh, experience of mindfulness, mindfulness is a term that's thrown around quite a bit nowadays, uh, but I think it could be helpful to kind of give a little bit of context to what that term really refers to. So mindfulness is most often defined as contact with the present moment. And a part of why that's so important is that there are many parts of our internal experiences that draw us out of the present moment. Things like anxiety inherently live in the future, right? Your mind is kind of pulling you into experiences of the future that you're worried about from now. Things like uh, sadness and grief, and in many ways, even things like anger, in many ways live in the past. Our mind pulls us to past experiences. We have all kinds of things that we think about from our past experiences and think, and think about anticipating or planning for our future experiences. And all of those different experiences exist outside of the present. And one of the inherent challenges with, with living in those different spaces is that we lose contact with what's happening in the here and now. And if you're not really in touch with what's happening in the present, you can really begin to lose a certain sense of intentionality in the choices that you're making. And you can ultimately be relegated into almost an autopilot process in your life where your life kind of just happens to you versus the other way around. So I think this really speaks to kind of shifting the narrative in how we interact in our relationships by bringing a certain sense of intentionality and purposefulness into how we're interacting with one another. So I think what's sometimes hard is, I think a lot of people will listen to what you said and say like, I can get on board with that intentionality and mindfulness, that's amazing. Um, and, and okay, I can see how having this on off dynamic in a, a relationship and in a marriage would serve the purpose of drawing our minds toward every, you know, not in an obsessive kind of way, but in a really intentional kind of way, the ways in which we interact with our spouse. Um, and again, I, I wanna, I just wanna name it that sometimes, even if we can get on board with the concept, it's inconveniently timed. Um, and so even if we're gonna say, okay, there's a mindfulness, maybe we'll even throw in, it helps maintain, you know, fight enmeshment and maintain individuality, it can still be very, very difficult. And um, I think that um, this is worthwhile to kind of explore a little bit, um, but I also think what's, what's, worth, what's worthwhile to explore is um, kind of the idea, which might be foreign as we are very autonomous beings um, in the modern world of, you know, what does it mean? And I'm, a, I'm asking Shai from, you know, from a psychological perspective, what would a psychologist say about using outside regulation to reach mindful behavior in your relationship? It's a great question. This kind of relates a little bit to that proverbial can of worms that you mentioned uh, earlier today, is that there isn't necessarily the quote unquote right way or wrong way to engage in that kind of awareness. So there's all kinds of intrinsic or extrinsic, internal or external modes that we use to kind of help bring ourselves into that space of awareness. And I think a part of this is not necessarily looking at this through the lens of, is it a good thing or a bad thing, but through the lens of, is it a workable thing or is it a, a non-workable thing? So if a couple were to say, we're able to find ways of, of bringing our sense of mindfulness and awareness into the experiences that we're having, that's a wonderful thing. I think part of what we talk about here with these, these different halachot, these different halachot that you're bringing up, is that this, this is actually bringing in this sense of intentionality through extrinsic, through external sources. So part of this is how couples internalize and integrate that sense of awareness and intentionality into how they're interacting with one another. So I think it's a it's a very challenging question if, if someone says, well, I can have that kind of mindfulness without having to have this on off cycle. Why is it I still have to do this if I can still bring this sense of intentionality? That's a great question. That I don't have a good answer to, but it does speak to how important it is for couples to be able to live with intention, to live with purpose in how they're interacting. 
And just to clarify, I think that's that's why when you look at this category of what we'll call the mindfulness category, these actions are not actions that are completely off limits. Again, look at the chart. They're actions that with a shinoi, with a little switch or with a heck hair, with some kind of extra recognition, they become permitted. So we shift the choreography a little bit and it leads to that mindfulness and that is its goal. Um, now, what that brings up for me next is, the, though, like, okay, so then our, is, is Hashem, and our rabbis in the way in which they interpreted and, and, and handed over this, this set of law to us, um, would they object ever to a couple saying, you know what, I, the, the choice that I'm making, a woman would say, I would like to use a form of hormonal contraception that perhaps I only have to get my period a few times a year, or I'm going to use um, a Morena IUD, with which for some people um, keeps their cycles, and for some women it gets rid of their cycles altogether. Like if it's so important to develop this mindfulness, perhaps we should not alter and not play with that in any way. But what I'd like to suggest as an answer to that is that you know the way that halakha works when it values something, and this is a, an idea that my colleague Yoetz of Halakha, Toma Warburg Sudensky, brings up from her grandfather, Rabbi Lamb, when halakha cares about something, it legislates it. And the more it cares about it, the more it legislates it. And therefore, yes, this dynamic of on-off, or what we might say in Hebrew, retzov shov, it is legislated slated through law. And that's even if it's not a constant in a a particular individual's life for one reason or another, um, the way that our system is set up does speak to the values that that our, that that Judaism, that Yiddishkeit is trying to convey. Now, are you ready for the worms? I don't know if I am, but we're gonna go. We're gonna really open the worms. We're gonna, we're using a few mixed met metaphors here. We're gonna go for the thorns. Okay, we're really gonna head into the thorns. Um, if you look on the screen, you can see that I put up two words, intimiut and autonomia. Now, they're Hebrew words taken from English, but if you look at them in Hebrew, it's like they're the exact same word, just like switch around the words, the letters a little bit. And um, I love it because it, it, it can reflect the way in which um, my autonomy, right, the way in which I feel in control and as the, the narrator of my life, really could impact the, the ownership of my intimacy and the way that I feel about intimacy and my ability to connect to my spouse. Um, and with this, with this idea, again, I'm gonna bring up something we brought up before, this idea of having outside regulation rather than self-regulation can really um, be a challenge for a lot of people. It's fine, we'll take care of it on our own. We don't need any outside regulation. So I'm wondering from a psychological perspective, you know, shouldn't, is this true? Should man be able to fully self-regulate when it comes to this area of life? Um, I'm curious if you could reflect on that from a therapist's perspective. Sure, so I think this speaks to a certain sense of, of awareness and sensitivity to how charged a subject this is. The parts of our brain that, sex, that, that regulate sexual arousal are not parts of the brain that we have conscious control over. We don't have the ability to turn those parts of our brains on and off. And it speaks to uh, being aware of just how human and how normal a, hu a human experience this is to say, we have to talk about how challenging this is. And in fact, there's a, uh, a psychologist and behavioral economist named Don Ariely who did a study in 2005 where he um, asked a, a group of college students about a list of different um, moral, either moral gray areas or clear moral uh, problematic areas uh, within the domain of sexuality. So, for example, would you ever lie to a girl, uh, you know, uh, in order to, to further your relationship with her? Um, would you ever touch a girl without her consent? Um, would you ever... Um, you know, uh, withhold information about like a, a, a sexually transmitted infection from a potential, a potential sexual partner. And all of these, these, uh, this is a study that was done uh, with men, all of these men said they would never do any of those things. But he then had them answer the exact same questions while they were in a state of sexual arousal and all of their answers changed. And he actually was able to point to how we actually process information differently, things like impulse control, things like 
how we uh, conceptualize good and bad and right and wrong actually changes we're in a state of sexual arousal. Now, I want to be very, very clear that in sharing this study, I am not in any way suggesting that if someone is in a state of sexual arousal, they're, they're therefore not responsible for what they do. Of course, they're still responsible for what they do. People never abdicate their, their sense of responsibility or ownership over the choices that they make. But this does speak to how our minds and our bodies process information differently when we're in a state of sexual activation. And that it becomes especially important to be attuned to what are the potential elements that might create that charge, that might impact my ability to self-regulate effectively. So what you're saying is we are post me too, thank God, but at the same time, a little external regulation does not do any damage. Correct. I don't think it does damage. I think it creates awareness, right? It allows a person to be in touch with, all right, what's going on in my experience here? And can I be especially attuned to being able to um, to protect myself about the things that might elicit particular particularly strong responses. Got it. So I'm going to head into the next intimidate autonomia issue, um, which is related to the question of women's autonomy over their own bodies um, and how that impacts their intimacy. Um, a lot of women express that the experience of regulating their body from the outside with with the decode, with preparation for mikvah, um, can be uh, can complicate this issue for them, and this is exacerbated by the fact that um, it, it is within the realm of sexuality. Um, we have a lot of regulation to do. Men men do have to regulate themselves, but in terms of the busy code, in terms of preparation for mikvah, and in terms of all that, um, you know, men's reproductive systems don't feel as linked to this regulation. And so there seems to be a little bit of an unevenness in the experience. Um, yes, men have to practice self-control, but there's, there's again, there's not that counting and the checking and that, that sometimes feels uneven. Um, and another issue that women bring up is why it should be that a woman's menstrual cycle would be so central in determining the rhythm of the couple's physical and emotional and intimate life. In other words, great, we're all for mindfulness, but is this the issue that has to drive that? Um, now, for some women, it's like, no, it's so obvious. I feel certain ways at certain times of month, of the month, and, it, and it, 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 it corresponds perfectly. And I'm so grateful that, you know, based on how my hormones are interacting with my body, I th that is the way in which things are regulated. But not everyone feels that way. And certainly with hormonal contraception that interferes and intervenes with that more natural cycle. And again, even with the more natural cycle, it's not always um, in line. And that can be very, very complicated. Um, and then if we're moving on to some of the more of the issues, you know, um, there can be the, the kind of feeling of disruption day to day, meaning I'm, I'm trying to, you know, live next to, in with, with this person and again, I said it before as Shinoi, just change it, just change the choreography just a little bit. But some people do feel and experience this um, with as a disruption. And not only that, but you know, here we are, we're talking about mindfulness, and a lot of women express concern. How do I switch um, back? Right? I'm heading to the mikvah. And um, even if I know that there's no obligation to be intimate on the mikvah night, if the couple is not mutually if they're not interested in being together, both both of them need to be interested and, and, and ready. Um, but even if that is the case, there is this feeling of like, wow, you know, we were doing this, we're doing this mindfulness, and now I don't know how to get out of autopilot off. How do I switch back? And that's very complicated um, for people. So Shai, do you have any tips um, or ways? I mean, we're heading to tips more at the end, but could you could you kind of talk a little bit about, about this? at this point. Sure, so you're actually talking about the exact same issue, but on the in the other direction, where it's if I get into autopilot in off mode, now I'm kind of an autopilot on off mode, and I become, it becomes more challenging to re-engage when touch is permitted again. So I think a part of this is, number one, is, is bringing this sense of mindfulness to both sides of that conversation. So it's not just, I need to be mindful of what things are when we're not touching, but it's also being mindful of what things are when we are touching. So being able to create this, um, this shift in the behavior by the increased sense of awareness, the increased sense of intentionality. And I think some of the valuable ways to do this are to create rituals surrounding how that transition takes place. 
So one of the things that um, that we talk about with with, a, with you know the the application of a heck error that it, when a couple goes into um, the 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 times that touch is not permitted, there's supposed to be some kind of um, reminder. You know, so some people might put like a, a, a vase with flowers on the table, or what is the, what are the things that we're doing to bring this into our consciousness, to bring this into our awareness that there is a change in our home right now, and that there is this kind of this transitional movement from being able to touch to not being able to touch, and that there is this this uh, this ritual that we engage in to kind of shift into that mode. What is the, the ritual of connection that we engage in shifting, transitioning back? So if that means what are the processes that a couple goes into, and certainly they're all the, the processes that a woman goes into in preparing for the mikvah, both physically and emotionally and mentally, what are the, what are, what's the process that the couple goes into to kind of transition in, in that ritual? So if it means that um, we're creating this this um, this mode, this uh, reminder of some sort that kind of brings us back into the into the state where touching is permissible, but also to be aware of the fact that there may still be almost like a recoiling if you extend your hand and you kind of like pause with, wait a minute, I I am I allowed to do this or am I not allowed to do this? And you may, there may be this natural inclination to kind of pull back, but then to say, well, no, I I'm uh, increasing my sense of awareness, my sense of mindfulness, my sense of intentionality that this is something that I'm doing because this matters to me, this is important to me. And it allows you to then create real meaning and reward be behind the specific acts of physical contact, of physical touch, because it's not just an automated process. It's a deeply intentional and purposeful process. Thank you for that. I want to also acknowledge the challenges that people have when, I, I kind of alluded to it before, but when women's cycles are not quite in sync, right? When, when if a woman has shorter cycles, whether, and I a little pause to say, if a woman is having intermenstrual bleeding um, and there is no reason, it's not that she's adjusting to a pill, it's not, you know, it's not that she, she needs to get that checked out, okay? Um, and that needs to be checked out by a, a physician. Um, but it's often during perimenopause, things change. Sometimes when women are breastfeeding, things change. Um, and this can be very, very difficult, right? It's not two weeks on, two weeks off. Last week, as, as we were having our conversations, I, was I think I had three calls in one day of women who were going through these issues um, and feeling like I just got back from the mikvah. Um, and checking to see, am I, do I have to, do we have to separate again? And, you know, and, and sometimes they did, right? It's not always like, don't worry, ask a question and it's fine. Sometimes you ask a question and you're told, I'm sorry, that sounds like it is a flow and it sounds like you do need to separate and it's very, very painful. Um, and I will also put out here ovulation before mikvah. Note that I call it ovulation before mikvah. I do not call it halakhic infertility. If you'd like to find out why, this is a shameless plug. Come to um, my talk with Dr. Bacheva Maslow and Dr. Karen Wasserstein, where we will address in our discussion of fertility treatments, the question of ovulation before mikvah, and we will deep dive into that a little bit. But, you know, look, we could go deep into all of these different challenges, um, but uh, I want to spend time on a really important part of this, which is those who might feel lonely and isolated um, and feeling emotionally distant. And so I'm curious, Shai, what, what are some of the considerations um, that are important when we think about these experiences of loneliness and isolation? You know, what, what would you say to people in the depth of this pain? So the first piece is just to acknowledge how deeply painful that is, right? We're talking about really raw, um, rudimentary parts of the human experience that desire closeness and desire intimacy and desire touch. And for those to not be a part of our experiences is a deeply troubling thing. And the first piece is to just to just name that experience. Like there's no sugarcoating what it feels like to feel isolated or to feel alone, to just acknowledge that is a very, very real, very uh, painful, very deep experience. And a part of this relates to um, what psychodynamic, psychoanalytic theory uh, uh, talk about with the inner child or, or what uh, Carl Jung called the puer eternus or the eternal child, um, or as one of, uh, among uh, my, my own personal psychology mentors and my own, my own father who I talked about the idea of what the little me is, the, the, the child inside is, that there could be um, a, a deep sense of, uh, of pull towards the parts of us that crave that connection. Right? When we think about development, we, we oftentimes think about development in a stepwise fashion. Like you kind of, you graduate from different stages of development. You know, you, you go from first grade to second grade, to third grade, to fourth grade, or, you know, I'm eight years old and then nine years old and then 10 years old, but development doesn't really happen that way. 
development is really more layered. You're just growing more layers on top of pre-existing developmental stages. And when we think about this idea of the little me, it's not just this part of me that existed in the past. This is a part of me that exists here now. And the part of me that craved connection and, and closeness and support and affection, those, those are parts of me that I, I learned as a, as a child you know, many years ago, but are still very much alive in me now. And to take that consideration into our experience, because this is not just some old part of me that, that you know, felt this pain long ago. It's a part of me that feels this pain in the here and now. And the reality is this can be a, a very disruptive element in a person's relationship. Even if a person has a healthy, functional relationship with good communication, this is still a big disruption in day-to-day -day life. Uh, so I think a, an important uh, consideration, important part of this, of this question to consider is what part of my own story, what part of my own narrative is being brought into this experience? Where, where am I experiencing um, my challenge and what part of my story gets brought up in this experience. Uh, and we can't fully control all the parts of our experiences that may contribute to pain. We can't run from the parts of ourselves that hurt because those are parts of ourselves that are here with us. Thank you for that. Um, I wanna share a, a slide and I want you to tell us what it means to you. We can't hear you. <laughs> and there have been some complaints that it's been a little a little low, but so we're sorry for the low. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? I hear you. I hope everyone else can hear you. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, we're having a, a little technical difficulty here. Um, <laughs> so this uh, this image is something called a cortical homunculus. And a part of why I wanted to bring this up is that the experience of touch is a deeply seated, very deeply rooted part of our experience. It's actually grounded in our own neurology. What a cortical homunculus is, is what a person would look like if the percentage of their brain allocated towards particular sensory and motor experiences represented what we looked like physically, or what rather, what, if what we looked like physically represented the percentages allocated to our brain. There are huge amounts, huge percentages of our brain that are dedicated to touch. Look, you can see how large the hands are. A big part of our human experience is touch. And when we tell someone we are removing that from part of your experience, that's a very deeply troubling, uh, problematic, difficult experience to have because this is a part of how we interact. We have this deep-seated drive, this deep-seated need to touch, but touch is also how we first learn love. It's how we first learn affection. If you think about, uh, and it's hard, you could, you could take down that picture now if you want. Um, when you think about what happens immediately after a baby is born, the first thing the doctor does is they place the baby back on the mother. And it gives the baby a chance to absorb the scent, the odor of the mother, and it lets the baby feel the mother. That is the first form of connection that we have. Young children, we don't feel love and affection by someone using words of affirmation or, or giving positive feedback nearly in the same way as we do when we experience touch. Touch is an unspoken, powerful way to connect to other people. And we can't ignore how central that is to the human experience. So barriers um, to, the, uh, to our experiences of touch can be very troubling. And when we think about other neurological elements at play here, when we engage in touch, there's something called the, the love hormone or the, or the connection hormone, which is also referred to as oxytocin which is released when we, when we experience touch. Oxytocin induces feelings of connection and feelings of closeness. There's research that links the release of oxytocin to better sleep. Even our immune systems function better when we are in close physical touch with other people. There's huge parts of our experience that are deeply intertwined with our sense of touch. We can't just pretend as if though we separate this, this experience of touch, like, oh, it's fine, it's just two weeks, don't worry about it. That's very troubling, that, that, that hits a very, a raw, very sensitive nerve for many people because that's how we feel connection. Just kind of going back to this idea of the little me, this inner child that I mentioned earlier, that's how we feel love. That's how we feel connected as children. And that doesn't go away. That's how we continue to crave that sense of affection from the people that are close to us. So to have that removed is very, it's a very big disruption. It's very, it's very, uh, very troubling, very upsetting. So I think you very much validated the deep struggles a lot of a lot of people experience, um, and I think that you know 
even if, and I, I hope we are all committed to halakha, and even if we appreciate the mindfulness that keeping these halakhot has the potential to bring, I want to see if we can offer our audience a way to connect to these parts of our partners without touch, right? Because you've just explained just how important it is. So we have to see, can we give our audience some practical tips? How can we navigate these invariable ups and downs that can accompany keeping these halakhot so that we can get as much benefit out of it as possible? Again, we're going to keep it anyway, but we might as well get what we get out of it. So I think uh, an important uh, idea to bring into this conversation is the role of values. And values, in effect, are almost the, it's like the compass that we use to guide us towards the things in our lives that are important to us. And if you think about the fact that you embody many different roles in your life, so any, any person who's listening to this talk right now, if you look at your own life, there's many different roles you embody in your life, right? You're someone's sibling or someone's child or someone's parent or you're an employee or you're a member of your community, or a member of your shul, uh, you're a Jew, right? you're, you're a citizen of your country. There's all of these different roles that you play in your life, and each of those different roles would be guided by a different set of values. So for example, the kind of parent you are is very likely to be different than the kind of employee you are, right? the kind of sibling you are, maybe very different than the kind of parent you are. But for us to be able to engage those different roles, we have to understand what are the values that drive that role? What's the compass that I have in those respective categories of my life that allow me to move towards the things in my life that are important to me. So I think an important part of this conversation is to what degree am I connecting to the values related to the mitzvot of, of Tarat Mishpacha? What, what values are driving my behavior? If we think about the fact that when we grow up, we engage in halachic practice or, or Torah practices because we're told to, right? You know, children learn to make bracho because their parents tell them to. We keep Shabbat, we learn what muksa is because our parents tell us or because our, or our schools tell us. We don't do these things because we're necessarily ourselves connected to them. We do them because we're kind of told to. But at a certain point in our developmental trajectory, we start to take ownership over the choices, right? At a certain point, you're not doing something because somebody told you to. You're doing something because you are choosing to. So granted, we may be, we may be aligning with these halachot because God told us to, or, or Chazal um, in kind of transmitting the, the, the Torah of Hashem uh, have, are, are kind of helping us uh, work towards or, or guide us towards that process but we still have to choose to do those things. Well, why are you choosing to do this? What values are driving you to engage in this part of your life, especially when there's a lot of challenge, a lot of difficulty that can be born out of some of those difficulties. So are we being, bringing intentionality? Are we bringing purposefulness into our experiences of our values? And it kind of brings to mind the famous Socrates quote, the unexamined life is not worth living. I kind of maintain that the unintentional life is not worth living. Because if you're not being intentional in your life, life is just happening to you. You're not living your life. Life is just happening to you. And for you to create reward and meaning and fulfillment in the experiences that you have, it requires intentionality. It requires mindfulness. And I think that's a part of what you can bring into this conversation, both internally for yourself or in the dynamic of your relationship, of how do we connect to the values that make this important to us? So um, I have a question for our audience. Does anyone know who said this quote? Because Shai claims he got it from somewhere, but so far we haven't found the source. So maybe he made it himself. We're just not sure. So you can head to the comments and let us know if you've ever heard this quote before, because it's a great one. It's definitely not my quote. I heard it from someone else, but I, I, I don't know the source of it. <laughs> Find the source without being distracted. Anyway, um, tip number two. We recommend you download our recommended couples exercises. As we were putting together our talk, we just kept coming up with more ways um, that we hope. It's a document below called Our Personal Holistic Narrative. And you'll see that we have some recommendations for ways in which you as a couple, maybe this is an activity to do when you are um, not having physical contact that, that part of the month. Um, and you can use these exercises and you can use them to connect to your spouse together. My brother and sister-in-law play a beautiful game with their children every Friday night at the Shabbat table. And it's called Rose Thorn Butt. Um, this is a shout out to Davidi and Becca. Um, and they go through, they say the rose, what was great? The thorn, what was tough? 
and the bud, what are they excited about that's coming up? So we've modified that activity to give you an opportunity to work on connecting your Tahrat HaMishbacha practice to your values. And we also have a um, exercise that's to help you reframe some of the thorns into a bud. Um, and really, um, I invite you to try to construct that personal halakhic narrative, especially when it's feeling far from frictionless. And just as we're heading toward Matan Torah, Shavuot is on its way. I want to unpack, uh, oh, by the way, first, there's another source there to unpack together. Uh, we leave a Torah source for you there, too. But I want to talk as we're heading toward Shavuot about a source that is meaningful to me, which is in Pirkei Avot, Perik Vav um, Halacha Bet, um, we have this idea that Hashem wrote, right, says in the Torah that Hashem wrote the Lucho Charut al-haluchot, right? That God wrote them charut al-haluchot, and the, um, the, in Pirkei Avot, it says, al tikra charut, don't say it's engraved on the luchot, el charut, you're freed by the luchot, she'en lecha ben chorin el amisha osek v'tamu Torah, you're only free if you're delving into the laws of Torah. And so, you know, there's this engraving that we do um, on the, um, of, by the Luchot. We have the Torah engraving on us. We, we surrender. We do. We surrender to halacha even and especially when it's hard. But that, there's this loop. This is the way my mother phrases it. There's a loop of the engraving which leads to the chayru. And there's this true mindful internalization of discipline that does lead to freedom. So it's only through that mindful engraving that we get to that chayru. And I also, we left for you below another gift. My colleague, Yoetzad Halakha, Tova warburg Senensky wrote a beautiful article um, on Times of Israel, which is down below. And, and one of the main points that Tova is making is that we must, anybody who is guiding couples when they're, in, especially women, when they're keeping these sensitive halachot, um, we must talk with women, find ways, even as they're completely submitting to the Ratzon of Hashem, to find ways to help them feel more autonomous in this behavior and in this experience. And um, one article, uh, one, one quote that really spoke to me very, very personally is she says, Halakha often requires surrendering control. Fostering a sense of connection and, uh, and ownership and surrender are not mutually exclusive. It's not one or the other. They can be simultaneously true. And I think that's a very, you know, sophisticated idea to try to capture. Okay, let's move on in our practical tools. Shai, can you please share some other ways that couples can navigate challenges as they arise? Sure. So, um, I had mentioned this idea of rituals of connection, which is an idea that's presented in John Gottman's research, who's one of the, um, the preeminent researchers in marriage and couples therapy in the world. And he talks about the idea of creating rituals to imbue meaning and purpose into your relationship. So um, what are the things that you do that uh, surround rituals, let's say, uh, attached to birthdays or anniversaries or Shabbat meals or of you know, going in or out of the time that you can or can't touch? What are the rituals that you engage in as a couple to create meaning behind how the two of you interact? And in the absence of those rituals of connection, some uh, it's, it's quite common, in fact, for in relationships for couples to feel a sense of distance or a sense of, um, or, or lack of purpose in the ways that they're interacting with, with each other. So I think one of the things that you can do is you can block off time to sit down as a couple and talk about what are some of the rituals we'd like to have in our relationship. And this is bringing, again, a level of intentionality into how the couple is, is, uh, is operating in their dynamic. It's not just a, a product of a passive process, process that we kind of fall into these routines and then we kind of just live our lives. And that, I, I think, kind of falls in more in, in stuff with what this idea of autopilot would be in a relationship. But what are the intentional processes that we're engaging in? So for a, couple to sit, for a couple to sit down and talk about what are the ways that we would like to bring this sense of intentionality into how we are navigating the, uh, the rituals in our life so that there is meaning and purpose behind those things that we're doing. So this is a process that is facilitated through open-ended um, open questions. And I think it's quite easy for couples to get, uh, to experience a sense of detachment or uh, or a lack of fulfilling connection when you're not really sharing of yourself, of your internal experiences 
in the way that you really like like to like them to be understood. And this um, the process of asking open ended questions allows you to connect to the other person's experience in a more deep and profound way. So if we think about um, the experience that either individual in the relationship may have during the times where touch is or is not permitted, and what that internal experience might be like, the only way for me to really understand and to connect to what is your experience is for me to engage in asking those, those kinds of open-ended questions. So uh, this facilitates, by, by the way, a process called empathic joining, which is a, a concept found in integrative behavioral couples therapy developed by Neil Jacobson and Andrew Christensen, in which in order for me to understand your experience, in order for me to be uh, compassionate with your experience, I have to some degree put myself into your shoes. I have to understand what does this feel like for you? And so the, the process of asking open-ended questions allows us to connect to what is the experience of the other. And then importantly, what are the ways we respond to that? How do we create these rituals of connection or creating shared meaning in the dynamics of our relationship through connecting, through facilitating this process of empathic joining? So in, uh, the, one of the, in the source sheet that, uh, that is shared, there's a list of different kinds of questions you can ask one another to help facilitate this kind of connection, this kind of closeness. So for example, if you were asking someone, tell me what touch means to you. What does it feel like for you when we don't touch? Is a much more open way of engaging that kind of conversation than saying, do you feel sad when we don't touch? Which is a closed ended way of asking that question. But asking questions in an open ended way allows the person to tap into their internal experiences and then allows you to connect to what their experience is because you're now you're, you're kind of seeing things through their you know, through their lens versus my projecting what my interpretation is onto them. So I'm kind of hearing things through them. So by engaging in this empathic joining, it allows me to put myself into your shoes and allows me to then connect in a way that's meaningful and rewarding so, so we can navigate things with this sense of purpose and intentionality. Okay, so I think we managed to pack like a three hour lecture into 50 minutes um, by just leaving you a lot of homework <laughs> down below in, uh, in the description. But I think that that actually would be a more effective way of really working on, on all of these very critical ideas. Um, we would like to open up the floor if anyone has any questions, comments, uh, things they want to bring up. It's always a little bit of trepidation when we do that, but we're ready. Well, I can also give a, a couple more points if you feel like we have a, a few more minutes to, to, uh, to go. We do. So keep going. All right. So if, if people have questions, we're more than happy to, to address any questions that may come up. Um, one other point that I think is very valuable for couples to engage in together, for, to be aware of together, is understanding the role of external stressors. Um, uh, from the work of Neil Jacobson that was integrated into John Gottman's work, uh, where Jacobson was trying to identify what are the most effective ways we can predict the longevity of the work in couples therapy. How well can we, can we ensure that the effects of couples therapy are long lived after the therapy is ended? And what he found to be the most significant predictor, much to John Gottman's, or much really to Neil Jacobson's frustration, was the presence or absence of external stressors which is very upsetting because the idea that, that the, you know, couples therapy only really works if we can prevent the presence of stress, well, we, we can't really prevent the presence of stress. So how are we supposed to help couples navigate the invariable ups and downs that take place in their relationship if we can't mitigate the presence of, that, of those stressors? And what John Gottman integrated into this work is being able to have conversations about stressful situations. And he calls it the stress-reducing conversation, that in order for couples to mitigate stress, we have to talk about stress. We have to talk about what our experiences are, and that in talking about those experiences, we're also then able to engage in workable forms of support if it means practical, pragmatic solutions, like how are we going to problem solve this particular stressor, or if it means offering support when support is needed, when, when maybe we can't necessarily fix or resolve the presence of that with that external stressor, uh, which actually reminds me of uh, a, uh, a question I, I always encourage couples to ask when, when there's a painful experience that comes up, if one you know, individual in the relationship shares with the other, whatever, whatever source of, of pain or stress we're dealing with, is to respond to that question, are you looking for support or are you looking for a solution? Because uh, 
you know, one person in the relationship may not be looking for a, a solution. They may just want to hear someone say like, you know, I hear you and I see you and, and I can understand how difficult or how challenging that might be for you. Whereas other people might say, no, I, I want you to problem solve this with me. But in order for us to learn what are the ways our partners really want us to respond to them, it starts off with having open conversations about what would be helpful for you in this situation? What do you want to see from me? So having this stress-reducing conversation allows couples to proactively identify the potential uh, threats or stressors in their environment, which then allows them to, to put together workable ways to say, here's how we're going to navigate the presence of this stressor. The, the, the application of the mitzvot and tarot mishpacha are very difficult, right? There's no, there's no kind of sugarcoating or, or you know, denying the fact that this is a very hard sele- uh, collection of halachot for couples to keep. And it does play a role in creating stress in relationships. And one of the things that this sometimes does is that it sometimes uh, it, it magnifies the presence of other issues in the relationship. Because if touch is, let's say, taken off the table, and touch is one of the ways we really connect and we feel love and we feel support, but now touch is not a part of our experience, it may, it may, um, it may accentuate or it may increase the, the, um, the, the intensity or presence of, the, of, let's say, deficits in verbal communication or deficits in emotional connection. Because I'm even more aware of the fact that I don't verbally communicate well if I'm not able to touch. Right. So it sometimes brings to the forefront other elements in the relationship that may actually be sources of difficulty. So for couples to have engaged in this stress reducing conversation allows them to say, "Okay, here's what we're dealing with. Here's here's the effect this has on me. Help me understand the effect this has on you. And let's talk about how we how we navigate the situation. But the only way to engage in that process is to is to have open dialogue. It's for couples to block off time to say, let's talk about what's going on. And how, how, how would I like you to respond to me? And how would you like me to respond to you? And what, what is the most difficult part of this experience for you? What would you like to see different? Um, I always encourage couples to talk about the underlying emotions that show up when, when pain shows up. So if, if someone in the relationship is sharing that they're feeling frustrated or they're feeling overwhelmed, well, what does it feel like when you feel overwhelmed? Well, it makes me feel like I'm, I'm completely out of control or I have, I have no control over my life. Well, what does that feel like for you to not feel like you have control over your life? Well, that makes me feel kind of scared. It makes me feel kind of, kind of, um, kind of small in the world. And when you're hearing those descriptions, you're really connecting to the deeper emotion there. We're not just talking about the, the manifestation of those, of those emotions in, on the, the, the more topical level of feeling overwhelmed or feeling frustrated. We're talking about those, those deeper emotional uh, currents that are running through that really stir up the parts of our experience that are painful. And when I hear that, that deeper level pain, that deeper level discomfort, it allows me to then say, let me connect to that part of your experience. Because when I hear someone saying, I'm feeling small or I'm feeling scared, it elicits a very different reaction than I'm feeling frustrated, even though that deeper emotion may be what's driving the frustration in the first place. So when we kind of tap into those deeper emotions, that's where that empathic joining takes place. As I mentioned earlier, that's where we can really have meaningful conversations about the stress-reducing conversation. It's where we can engage in these open-ended questions to connect to a person's experience. And uh, the more we have open conversation, open dialogue about, the, about what's going on in the dynamics of, the, of our relationships, the more we are able to find workable ways to navigate some of those stressors that take place. So as I'm listening to your recommendations, I'm thinking, you know, it, it makes sense to take advantage of the time that we are not touching in order to work on these deeper issues, these emotional currents, as you call them, uh, without being able to rely on touch. But at the same time, um, I think it's very important to really, again, validate people's experiences and to say that like, we're these issues that the fact that these can bring this can bring mindfulness is at it's it's true at the exact same time as this is hard and the rambam says it which is another sign like you know we the rest people knew that this was hard from it's not like oh this is so easy to keep you know the rambam on the source sheet that i brought he you know he says there's nothing there's no law that that was given to us that's more difficult to keep than these rules um and and then it goes on to say that at matan torah when we received these laws we went crying to our tents um and it's important to really um 
own that and honor that. That doesn't mean okay, let's over. You know, it's it, it. We're not we're not over. We're not getting rid of these things because we we are simultaneously recognizing the ways in which Hashem's wisdom and the wisdom, the collective wisdom of thousands of years of of rabbinic uh, adjudication can be um, a benefit. So. Again, I doubt we closed the the, the um, can of worms perfectly. I don't know that that's possible, um, and I'm sure a lot of people have to digest this. And I also am um, I'm certain that this takes a lot more unpacking. And I encourage everybody to try, as we all can, to to see if we can take out the thorns, see the hedge of roses, turn the thorns into the buds. Um, and Yoatzot uh, Halacha, Nishmat Yoatzot Halacha are here to listen, to talk with you, to troubleshoot specific issues that are coming up in your relationships. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Bye.